Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Josh and I'm on staff here at The Branch and it's really good to be connecting with you today. If you're watching through our website, go ahead and check in and let us know you were here. Um, we would love to have a conversation with you in the chat box as well. So go ahead and say hi and we would love to talk with you. Uh, you can even submit a prayer request if you wanna do that. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe, like the video, comment on it. We can have a conversation together this morning or tonight or whenever you're watching this. We would love to do that. Uh, we are also starting a new series today. We're going through the red letters of Jesus, John 14 to 16. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what Chris has to say about it. So we're gonna spend some time in worship and then we're gonna listen to Chris. So go ahead and pull your sermon notes up on our app and we'll get there in a second, but first let's worship.
Wilburn spent a good chunk of the fall battling COVID, and on two different occasions, he had to be put on a ventilator, and for those of you who aren't aware of what a serious step that is, uh, anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of people who are put on a ventilator while dealing with this virus don't come off of the ventilator after being on it for several days. And so it was a big step when they chose to put him on a ventilator. And so before they put him on the ventilator, he was given a chance to FaceTime with family members. His wife, of course, my wife's twin sister, Shannon, his children, he called his sister and he called Tara and I late late one night before they put him on the ventilator. And there through labored breathing, he told us some things that he wanted us to know were he never to make it off the ventilator. And I'll never forget that call. He was on a ventilator twice, in fact, in two different seasons. And both seasons, he had things that he wanted to say in case he never came off the ventilator. Thankfully, Mitch is one of those who made it to life on the other side of the ventilator, thanks be to God, and is doing quite well again in Tulsa after some 45 days in ICU. And I'm so grateful for the prayers of so many of you who engaged in the labor of prayer during this time. But that moment marked me. I'll never forget being there in bed with my wife, Tara, and taking that call late at night while we were half asleep. And ever since then, I have just found myself with this profound awareness that all of us one day will say our last words. Most of us won't have an idea at the moment that they are our last words. I think of those precious people that were caught in that 133-car pileup a couple of weeks ago on I-35 in North Fort Worth, and several of the people who lost their lives in that pileup, when they left early that morning to drive to work, they had no idea that the last words they uttered to someone else before walking out that door, or maybe when they were on their cell phone that morning, were in fact their very last words. But if you knew that you in fact were in your last days or last hours, you would think about your last words. You would think about who you'd want to spend your time with. And you would want to unload your heart in some way. I know I've seen it in my own life when I have been with people who knew they were in their last hours and they literally had a list of particular things they wanted to say to particular people in their life and they wanted me present sitting ringside while this was happening. I've seen this over and over with my own eyes, and I would just ask you to consider, if you knew you had a very limited time left to live, what would the words be that you would want to say, and who would you want to say it to? And the reason I'm saying all of this is because today we are actually beginning a series that's going to take us all the way right up to Easter in what is some of Jesus' last words to his disciples. The night before his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion is one long conversation he has with his disciples around a dinner table in John chapter 13 through John chapter 16. And we're going to walk through this little section in the Gospel of John over the next several weekends because it's in this context that Jesus knows his time is short and he wants to unload his heart And I'm calling this series Until Then because basically what he's doing is he's basically talking to them about what's important about how they're to live until his return. 
And we're still in this period of time. So what he says to them is also said to us. And so much of what Jesus says here as he embarks on the last 24 hours of his life prior to the cross captures the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You actually got a preview of this last week when we wrapped up where do we go from here and we looked at a passage out of John chapter 13, 34 and 35 when one of the first things Jesus tells his disciples is he says, hey, listen, love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That was a fundamental instruction. He wanted them to understand until he returned. So we pick up today with more of this conversation. Jesus is telling him, I'm going away. Something they're still slow to understand at this point. Picking up in John 13, 33. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Am, we'll stop right here in the reading for a moment. The fact that Jesus tells his followers not to be troubled ought to tell you that he's just told them something to trouble them. (laughs) It's kind of like your, you know, your kid saying to you, hey, mom, dad, I don't want you to worry. Guess what? They've just done or said something that's going to make you worry. (laughs) Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why would he say that? Because he's just told them a, a couple of very troubling things. He's told them for one, hey, I'm going to be leaving you soon, and you can't go with me. Well, that's troubling, because they've been going with him for three years. Here's the second thing. He tells Peter, in front of all of them, that Peter is going to wind up disowning him. Not once, but three times. Before 6 a.m. the next morning. Talk about troubling. And so with Jesus talking about his departure And that they can't come with him. And on top of that, Jesus calling Peter out and saying, Peter, you're going to diss me before the end of the evening. They're troubled. And yet what does Jesus say next? This is so powerful. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Even though he's prophesied of Peter's failure, he still calls Peter to believe in him. And all of his disciples for that matter. Let me tell you why. This is so important. Because even... Though you and I have done terrible things that we regret in our life, the answer for going forward is still the same answer as it was before we did those terrible things. It's to believe in Jesus. It's to place our trust in him. That answer hasn't changed. The answer you learned when you first started with Jesus is still the same answer since you've done a terrible thing that you regret. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Even though we do terrible things we regret, even though we're going to do things that we're ashamed of, he welcomes our belief and our trust again. Isn't that good news? And so even after he tells Peter what Peter's going to do, he says, hey, believe in God. Believe also in me. And even more than that, even though we do terrible things, even though we are disloyal to him, he still wants to make a future with him possible. This is so good. And so he goes on to speak of of his father God having a house with many rooms. And he's going to prepare a place for him. Now this is so interesting because um, 
He has used the term Father's house one other time in the Gospel of John. You know what it is? It's in John chapter 2 when he's, when he's cl- turning the temple upside down. You know, we had a winter storm that flooded our campuses. They had a Jesus storm in Jerusalem. He turned the temple upside down in Jerusalem in John chapter 2. For a lot of different reasons, he was frustrated. But he, he, then he says in the course of turning the whole temple upside down, is it not written, my father's house will be a house of prayer. We understand that. But he called the temple in Jerusalem his father's house. But here he is letting them know, hey, my father's got another house with many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. There's so many big things Jesus' words here is speaking to. So many big things. For one, I believe he's speaking to the realm of heaven. There's more to this life than just this life. And while Jesus has everything to do with this life, he also has everything to do with preparing a place for us in the next life and preparing us for that place through his blood. I'm tell you what, this comes to mean more and more to you when you sense the end is near in your life. And this comes to mean more and more to you when you're dealing with a loved one who's passed on. I think about that, even in the life of our church right now. You know, I think we have, we're arriving at close to 35 households in the branch that have lost a father, a mother, or a sibling to the virus or to a virus-related complication since last March. 35 households. Those people that they lost, they may have not belonged here, but they were the father, mother, or sibling of someone who belonged here. And in three cases, households lost a father and a mother or a parent and a sibling in the same household. And so there's still a lot of grief that people feel understandably. And yet, he has gone to prepare a place for them and for us. And in that place, there are many rooms. Even more than this, the reality that there's more to this life than just this life is what helps you cope with this life. Until you're confident that you have a room in the next life, in the Father's house, you're not going to really be able to cope confidently with this life. This is huge right here. The second big thing that Jesus' words speak to is his return. He's going to, I'm going to be back. He says, I'll be back to take you to be with me where I am. Now, when I think about how the disciples are hearing this, they have no idea what he's saying. You know, even what I'm saying right now is read from a more informed position like you because we're 2,000 years on the other side of this. They have no idea what he's saying. It's coming out of him like a fire hydrant. But isn't it wonderful that our lack of understanding when it comes to what Jesus is up to doesn't stop Jesus from doing what he's doing? They don't have the foggiest idea what he's talking about in so many ways. You know what? No matter how little you understand Jesus, no matter how disloyal you've been to Jesus, no matter how, how much you feel like you don't know, he's still at work preparing a place for you and preparing you for that place. And what he calls for you is to place your faith and your trust in him. The words of Jesus here also tell us how, he's, how he views what he's about to go through. The profound suffering he's about to go through, he views it as it's all to prepare a place for you and preparing you for that place. And when you think about all the suffering that he's going to go through as a part of preparing a place for you, you can bet he's going to come back and take you to be with him where he is because he's about to do an awful lot of work for that to happen. Back to the conversation. It's all coming at the disciples so fast. They can't keep up. Let's pick back up verse 3. Jesus is saying, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. (laughs) So how can we know the way? I love it that Thomas interrupts him. Do you know how, how much courage it takes to interrupt a teacher? Particularly one 
teaching with authority like Jesus? It takes a lot of courage to ask a question like this. Uh, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. You just said we know the way to the place. We don't even know where you're going. So how can we know the way? It takes some courage to ask that. But Thomas's question sets up one of the most famous lines of Jesus. Verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's here we arrive at these disturbing words of Jesus, at least to some today. Because he doesn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, I am a life. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's exclusive language. Time is short for Jesus. He's headed to the cross, and he wants it to be perfectly clear. And he's so clear that it disturbs many today when they read this. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of people that have a lot of heartburn with this verse, including believers who belong to churches, but they wince when they see this verse. There's a lot of people in the world that have heartburn with this verse, with Jesus identifying himself exclusively as the way, the truth, and the life. Because we live in a day and age where people are increasingly uncomfortable with saying that one way is better than another, that one thing is truer than another. Hear me out. There have been plenty of times where the church's arrogance has not helped here. There's plenty of fault, too to be blamed on the part of the messengers. But this message is hard to swallow because the climate of our culture is there is no one way that is better than another. There's no one way that is truer than another. And many are uncomfortable with somebody making a claim that their way is better or more valid than someone else's. So I want to take a couple of moments and I want to digress and speak to this in case somebody deep down inside is really dealing with some heartburn about this or maybe you have relationships with people who they've been courageous enough to bring up their reticence about this. If you struggle with Jesus being the way instead of just a way, I want you to consider some things. First of all, consider this. All of us have life experiences which tell us that some ways are better than other ways. Sometimes I, I, I wonder, why are we so offended? Because all of us already live our life assuming that some ways are better than other ways. The, the original word for way here in the language that, um, that John is writing is the word for road. Jesus is saying, I'm the road, I'm the path. We have plenty of experiences in life with the fact that which road you take does matter all roads don't lead to the same destination. Some roads lead to a particular destination and some don't. You, this is reality. We all understand this. Here's a second thing to consider. Practically speaking, there are already many areas in our lives where we are already living as though others have knowledge that is superior to ours. We're already living this way. I don't know a thing about cars. I can barely put gas in mine. But when I have a car problem, I want to take it to someone who knows about cars and how they work. I'm not going to take it to Ryan Rainey. I'm not going to take it to Tim Ketcherset. And you're not going to take your car to me. <laughs> when I've got a car problem, I don't need somebody who has an opinion or a belief about cars. I need somebody who knows how the vehicle works, who has a working knowledge of it. I just don't take my car to any person. I am exclusive in who I bring my car to because some people know more than others. I take it to a mechanic. A mechanic has superior knowledge. Let's say you have a tumor in your brain. 
You wouldn't be comfortable with me saying, you know, none of us really know what's happening inside of people's skulls. My ideas about the brain and brain surgery are, are really, they're no worse than the ideas down at UT Southwestern or anybody else's. And you know what? The American Medical Association's Guide to Brain Surgery, that's just a, that's just a clever ploy to control a gullible public. So let me just crack open your scroll and see what we got. No. We all know that some people have superior knowledge to others in certain matters. We all know that some things are true and some things are not when it comes to how our cars work, how our brains work. And there are some people who know more than others about such things. My point is this. You already practice exclusivity in your seeking a truth when it comes to things like your car and your body. We already live this way. This shouldn't be a big jump. Here's the bigger question. Why Jesus? Why should we trust what Jesus says here? Why should we take his word for it? Let me bring you to another thing to consider. Consider the depth of his suffering. If he's just a way rather than the way, then why did Jesus have to die the terrible death he did and face the suffering he faced? You know, one of our problems with war and the cost of human lives is we want to know, has every other ex um, option been exhausted before we risk American lives in this issue? Because can you imagine how parents and spouses of fallen soldiers would feel if they found out that the ultimate price they paid for a loved one wasn't necessary? Can you imagine that? No one was more interested than Jesus in finding other options. No one was more interested in Jesus in there being multiple ways if there could be. Do you remember Gethsemane when Jesus prayed, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me? If there was anybody that was interested in there being another way, it was the one who was going to face the suffering. But there wasn't another way. And so there isn't. If there is another way to the Father, why did Jesus suffer as he did? Even more than this, though, I think it's wise to consider his suffering anytime you run into someone or even deep down inside you may wonder, is Jesus just kind of self-serving in his claim? I've had somebody be honest enough with me before to talk about, could Jesus have been a narcissist? saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me tell you what, the reason you consider his suffering is because no narcissistic, no self-centered person would take on this kind of suffering and death that he took on. Narcissistic people and self-centered people, they're more interested in other people's suffering before they get to the point of suffering. No narcissistic self-centered person would take on the kind of suffering and death he took on to be willing to treat, to be treated and to die as the worst of criminals and to be seen as a rejection and a failure. Tell me a narcissistic and self-centered person who's willing to be seen as a rejection and a failure and to die as a loser. You say, okay, Chris, but a crazy person might. True. We'll talk about that in just a second. <laughs> but we're talking about a narcissist or self-centered person and some cynics would say, Jesus comes off as one here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But you have to consider his suffering. No narcissist or self-centered person is going to be willing to suffer like this. Well, what about crazy? Which leads me to the next thing to consider, his resurrection. As Paul said in Romans 1 and 4, Jesus Christ our Lord was shown to be the Son of God when God powerfully raised him from the dead. Jesus being raised from the dead is what makes you pay attention to everything he said before he died. When Jesus was raised from the dead, that basically destroyed the idea that he was just a self-deceived crazy person. <laughs> Jesus 
Jesus did what no one has ever done. He called a shot in advance, saying he would die and be raised to life three days later, and it happened. There have been other Messiah-like figures who said the same thing, like a David Koresh or a Jim Jones or a fill-in-the-blank. Only one has turned out to experience this. There's a difference between Jesus and a self-deceived man. The resurrection is a difference. Well, how can I be really sure the resurrection happened? That's another sermon for another time. I've taught about that. You can email me. I can send you some resources there. But what Paul says is true in 1 Corinthians 15 when he said, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. His resurrection has everything to do with his authority to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The jury was out when he said it. It wasn't as out when he walked out of that tomb. Maybe he was telling the truth, that he really is the way, the truth, and the life. And let me give you another thing to think about. If you struggle with this idea of Jesus being the way instead of, hey, just a way, I'll say this. If he's not the way, then he most certainly isn't even a way. And here's what I mean. I think about those famous words of C.S. Lewis that he wrote in Mere Christianity, where Lewis said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. He's either Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. And Lewis is right. Wrote, he wrote it 80 years ago. He's right. No good moral teacher is going to say the things that Jesus said. Speaking of what he said, let's finish the rest of the passage. Picking up in verse 7. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the work themselves. You say, what is Jesus after here? By the way, are you listening? It's hailing. You need to pay attention to this message. (laughs) What is Jesus after here? What's he driving for? Four times in these verses, he speaks to these people who've been following him and he calls them to believe in him after they've been following him for three years. He's still calling them to believe in him. To believe what? That he's preparing a place for them, that he's the way to that place, but more than that, he's the way to know the Father and that the Father is in him. In other words, you want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. And he's telling them that it's in fact God Who's been here washing your feet tonight? The God who created the heavens and the earth. The one who made the promise to Abraham that he'd be the father of a great nation is in the room with you right now. The one who met on the top of Sinai with Moses. The one who was there splitting the Red Sea in half. He's in the room with you. The father is in me. And if you're with the son, you're with the father. And if you're following the son, you're following the father. He wants them to know this now because of what they're about to witness. In less than 24 hours, they will witness a crucified God. The God they've read about their whole lives in the Old Testament was in the flesh and bud in front of them. And he wants them to be clear about it before he does what he's about to do. 
a God you've read about your whole life is in the room with you. Pay attention. Pay attention the next three days to what I'm about to do. He's calling them to believe this about him. So what? Let me leave us with two takeaways. The first is this. For those who have yet to believe in him, will you? For those who have yet to believe in him, will you? He asked for you to believe in him. He asked for you to trust him. Will you? Because your belief and your trust in him matter to him. No matter your past, no matter what you've done, no matter your regret, no matter what you're ashamed of, he welcomes your belief and trust because he suffered for your past and all that you're ashamed of and all that you regret. And he's been raised from the dead for your belief and your trust. And there's no relationship with him without belief and trust, just like there's no relationship with anybody without belief and trust. No marriage is going to thrive without belief and trust. No friendship is going to thrive without belief and trust. It's impossible to have a real relationship without belief and trust. He's not asking for your perfection. He's asking for your belief and your trust. And until he returns, he'll ask you to believe him and trust him. After every failure, after every expression of disloyalty, no matter how far you've gone for him, no matter how long you've followed him, no matter how much he's used you in the past, every day you wake up, he's asking you, believe in God, believe also in me. I want to just say a word. I want to say a word to any of you watching online. If you've never had a moment in your life where you have owned it, not for anyone else, for you, have placed your faith and your trust in him in just a minute, when we take communion, there's going to be a slide pop up on the screen and there's going to be a number. And if you're ready to express your faith and trust in Jesus, but you want to talk to somebody about it, you want to pray with somebody about it, you want to share a commitment you're making in your heart right now, you can text Jesus to that number on the screen during communion, and we will be prompt in following up with you. This is the question of life. Will you believe in him? Will you trust in him? There's a second question I would ask of the so what, and it's this. For those who say they do believe, will you keep your eyes fixed on him? And here's why. You only really know what God is like to the extent that you know Jesus. I know it says in God we trust on our dollar bills. I appreciate the sentiment, but that doesn't tell you anything about the kind of God you trust or what he's like. Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is the standard by which any view of God that circulated in the world or that circulated in the church must be measured. If our conviction, if our declaration, if our story of what God is like or what God isn't like doesn't line up with Jesus, it's not really God. And I'm saying this because there's a lot of people and churches who even though they have a history of following Jesus can take their eyes off of him and buy into all kinds of ideas about God that just don't line up with Jesus. And then they make decisions and actions based on those false ideas about God which only hurt themselves and others. Which is why I would say to anyone who even has a history of trusting in Jesus, don't ever take your eyes off Jesus because he's the final revelation of God. And sometimes it's easy for us to take our eyes off Jesus. As the Hebrew writer says, to believers, to believers in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. He's telling believers, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneers and the perfecter of faith. Jesus perfects our faith. That means a lot of things, but one of the things that means is he perfects your view of God. And let me tell you what, you and me still need our view of God perfected. And here's why this is so important, because how you think about God has a lot to do with how you view everything else in all the world and how you treat everyone else. 
As one writer put it, Jesus did not come to change God's mind about you. It's not like Jesus came and died on the cross to to ask God to reconsider how he feels about you. Jesus didn't come to change God's mind about you. Jesus came to change your mind about God. Jesus came to perfect your faith, to refine your view. Jesus came to make sure you get the picture because Jesus is the best picture ever taken of God. So fix your eyes on Jesus. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and take what you have for communion. And I want you to consider what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you during this time. Is there something in this message that speaks to you right now? And I would just say to you that if you would like to talk to someone further about believing in Jesus, or if you want to share your commitment to do so, our, we, we have people down front. We would love to connect with you immediately after the service here in just a few moments. Do not leave here. Let us pray with you. Let us visit you with you. Let us hear how we can help you. But first, let's just take a couple of moments and be before the Lord. Everyone is welcome to take communion and consider what the Spirit of God is saying to you during this time. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Jesus, I pray that this word would make its way just 12 inches south from our brain into our heart. I'm I'm counting on your promise that wherever two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are with them. I'm counting on you being here in this moment before each one of us calling us yet again. You believe in God, believe also in me. Every day, Lord, we want to walk out an ever-deepening trust in you. We give you thanks for preparing a place for us and calling us to believe in you even in the wake of our worst days, (laughs) to trust in you to follow you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.
so glad that you joined us today. It was really, really good to connect with you. The elder selection process is underway. Uh, if you've been keeping up to date, the names have been submitted and now we are praying and discerning what the Lord would have for us and for those names that were submitted. So if you could just pray with us, that would be awesome. Uh, but for now, have a great week and we're excited to see what the Lord will do in and through you today and this week. So we'll see you next time.